Koinonia House is a nonprofit Christian ministry that is supported by the purchasing of materials and donations. To learn more about Koinonia House and the materials that we have available, visit khouse.org. And please be responsible in the sharing and dissemination of this information and respect the copyrights therein. Thank you. It is a bit overwhelming for me to be here at Bethlehem College speaking to educators. What a privilege, because you're going to reach our kids through the classroom, not the pulpit. I think that's exciting. Our organization is not only transnational, it's transdenominational, so we really appreciate this approach to improving the biblical literacy. And uh, what, a, what, a, what an initiative is, is represented by this gathering. I, I just appreciate that. As some of you may know, we wrote a, a, a book that's the, become a definitive text, uh, Cosmic Codes, uh, Hidden Messages from the Edge of Eternity, but it's a very heavy tome, so we have a very little summary of it called Hidden Treasures, and that's what I'm going to draw on for this little gathering. Uh, I come to this whole uh, topic from a high-technology executive background rather than a seminary background, and because of that, uh, I have perhaps a little different perspective. This little diagram is just a warm-up thing. It, it uh, will draw up on its impl implications later in the talk. But um, you, you, you notice that in the Bible, of course, there's 12 tribes of Israel. And you can always leave one out and still have 12. You may wonder how that's done. Uh, not by this diagram. You'll see that a little later. But I just, that's just my little teaser to see, make sure that everything else is working. So we'll just move on here. We're going to talk about hidden treasures. I should tell you right up front, I get so frustrated on a broadcast where we have some Christian commentator make some positive statement about the Bible, but he always prefaces it with a little uh, disclaimer. You can't prove the Bible, but, and then they go on to make their positive statement. I'm so tired of that, because yes, you can. And I want to show you some things that I think will put you on a little different footing regarding this incredible treasure that we have here in our laps, the Word of God, from a little different perspective. And so this is going to be the first part of two-part thing here. But in our little book here, we have a warning on it that uh, it's sort of like a cosmetic warning on a, on a prescription drug or something. This presentation may prove damaging to the comfort of closely held presuppositions. And we don't try to play favorites. We'll have something in this briefing to offend everybody. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can there. And so our ministry has really based on two discoveries. And these discoveries you should not take because I assert them. I want you to challenge them in your own study. The, dis the discovery is that these 66 books that we glibly call the Bible, even though they were penned by over 40 different guys who didn't even know each other, and yet despite that there's 66 books, over 40 authors, and this was gathered of a, over a period of over about 2,000 years. Now, the significant discovery that comes out of this is that there are two discoveries. The first is that these 66 books, penned by over 40 different guys over several thousand years, is an integrated message system. I'm using that as a technical term. I'm not saying that there's a theme in the Old Testament fulfilled in the New. No, much more than that. The thing you need to discover is that every number, every place name, every detail in those 66 books is there by deliberate design. And that's something you need to discover for yourself. Because if once you discover that, it changes your perspective in regarding the integrity of the whole. Not just in broad brush sense, in a very detailed way. When you discover that, you stumble into a second discovery about that. That the origin of that package had to originate from outside our time domain. It has supernatural origin, and you can prove that very simply by doing just what I said. So I want to challenge you with that and, and to dwell on that as we go. So one of the places we're going to go, now I know this is going to make some people nervous here, but just bear with me, are there hidden messages in the Bible? And uh, that is uh, mentioned several places. One way is in Proverbs 25 too. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing and the duty or honor of kings to find them out. So I'm going to show you some of those things as an example. Let's start with the riddle. We all know who, who's the oldest man in the Bible. Anybody? 
Who's the oldest man in the Bible? Anybody? Methuselah. Methuselah. Good for you. He, he lived 969 years. And yet he died before his father. Does that bother you? He's the oldest man in the Bible, but he died before his father. See, everybody forgets who his father was. And so uh, his father was Enoch, right? Now, Enoch's an interesting guy. We know quite a bit about Enoch, strangely enough. When he was 65 years old, something happened in his life which caused him from that day on to walk with God, whatever that means, okay? What happened there? Something else you need to understand, the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. The flood of Noah was preached on for four generations. And Enoch was told that as long as his newly born son is alive, the judgment of that flood would be withheld. And he, that's why he named him Methuselah. As you analyze that word in the Hebrew, it comes from a root, muth, which means his death. It occurs 125 times in the Old Testament. And the verb shalak, which means to send forth, to bring or set forth. The name Methuselah actually means, from the roots, his death shall bring. And it's interesting, as you study your Bible, Methuselah lived 187 years, and then he had a son by the name of Lamech. And when, and Lamech was, when he was 182, he had a son by the name of Noah. And we know that in, it was in the 600th year of Noah that the flood came. In other words, Methuselah's life was a duration of God's mercy, but it get, got to a point when the judgment came. So it, it, he fulfilled that prophecy. You girls, can you imagine raising that kid? Every time he caught a cold, the entire neighborhood would go into panic. As long as he's alive, everything's fine. But when he died, the flood came. Now, what's interesting about this is, when you get to Genesis chapter 5, we tend to sort of skip over it. Genesis 1 and 2, the creation, that's great stuff. Genesis 3 is the seed plot for the whole Bible. Genesis 4, the murder, and so forth. And Genesis 6 on is the flood of Noah. Gen Genesis 5 is one of those chapters you have a tendency to skip over. I mean, what is it? It's just a genealogy of ten guys, okay? Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. The problem with Genesis 5 is that it's not translated for you. We, most of us are operating from an English translation. In this case, those names are transliterated. The meaning isn't there. It's an approximation of how they pronounced it. And so we, 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 we don't know how to deal with it. See, what do names mean? My legal name is Charles. What does that mean? Nobody knows. It's been lost. People have different conjectures, but no one's quite sure. Many of us in this room probably have names that were just given to us by our parents because it appealed to them at the time. It doesn't necessarily carry significance. But in Hebrew, it's a whole other thing. Many of you may not realize that Hebrew is the only language that's semimic, not just phonetic. Most alphabets are phonetic. They, they, they lend insight as to how you pronounce a word. Hebrew is unique in that the original Hebrew, the Paleo-Hebrew, symbolized a concept, not just a sound, a meaning. The first letter was written sort of like an oxen's head. It re represented strength or first. Aleph, that's what it originally meant. After the Babylonian captivity, Hebrew adopted a, a box form that we see today. It's lost its roots from its original Paleo-Hebrew. The uh, in, uh, Hebrew department of the University of Arizona pointed out to me that if they teach the kids the Paleo-Hebrew letters, which will remind them of the meaning of the letter, they can end up, th that takes maybe an hour to learn, they can read about 80% of Hebrew, because Hebrew verbs, especially, but Hebrew words are based on a three-letter root. And if you know the alphabet, the meaning of the alphabet, you can know what the word will mean. The aleph there is, typically means first or strength, uh, and, and, or leader, if you will. The second letter is bet, originally written like it is on the left. Today it's written a little differently, but that bet represented a house or home. And bet, that's what it means. It means house or family. Bethlehem, the house of bread. Bethel, the house of God. See, Beth, the, the letter itself carries meaning. It's a, it's, a, it has a, it's a semime, not just a phoneme. And so if you take an aleph and a bet together, that's the first, uh, uh, or the, the leader of the house. Who's the leader of the house? That's their name for father, you see. Abba, Abba, father, okay. And uh, 
If you take the letter he, which is a breath, like an open window or two arms reach up, the word he is a breath or spirit, if you will. If you put a he in the middle of the word, it represents the essence of that word. And if you take, a, it, it comes from hands lifted up, what have you. So it means behold or, or, or uh, revealed or wind or, sp or, or spirit. Breeze, wind, is a he. And uh, so if you take the ab, the aleph and the beth, and put the he right in the middle of it, that gives you the essence of the Father. You following me? What is the essence of the Father? It's the, his, the word is love. Ahab is the Hebrew word for love. See, the point I'm trying to get across is in the Hebrew, the letters themselves carry the meaning, not just the sound. And that's why we, if you understand that, you can generally infer the meaning of the word from the structure of the letters. And so that's, so uh, now, when Ab remember Abram and Sarah, uh, Sarai, I should say, changed their name. When God changed the name, he simply, what he did was, he added a he in the name, he inserted the Spirit of God in their lives, and Abram became Abraham and so forth. Well, let's get back to our little genealogy, bear with me, in Genesis 5. The first one is Adam, and that's pretty straightforward. Adama means man, no problem there. Um, so, his son, Seth, means appointed. In this case, chapter 4, the earlier chapter in Genesis, Eve explains it. Eve, Eve said, For God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom came, who came slew. So, uh, so the, 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 mean, the, the name Seth meant, means appointed. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Let's, the next one is Enosh, and that is a verb which means mortal, frail, or miserable from the root Anosh, which is uh, usually used of a wound or grief or something like that. Pretty tough handle to go through school with. He has a son by the name of Kenan. Not Canaan, as some of your Bibles say, it's Kenan, because uh, Balaam, in fact, does a pun on those names in Numbers. But the point is, that word can mean sorrow, dirge, or elegy. That's another tough label to go through school with. You know, hey, sorrow, you're on our team. You know, it, it, it <laughs> it's a pretty tough name. So when he has a son, he says, enough of this. He named his son a mouthful, but a great name. He called his son Mahalalel. Mahal, which means the blessed or, or, or praised one. And uh, El, of course, the name for God. So Mahalalel, it's a mouthful, but what it means is the blessed God or the praised God. So far, so good. Now his son is named Yared, which is a verb uh, meaning uh, to, to come down. And there's a whole story behind that. I'll spare you for this particular discussion. And he has a son by the name of Enoch, which we've mentioned already, but what does the name Enoch mean? It turns out it's an academic term. It, 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 re, it means commencements or, or teaching, if you will. And uh, Enoch, of course, as I said before, had, uh, had a son by the name of Methuselah. And of course, that was his death shall bring. And that was the year when he dies is the year the flood came. We went through that. He has a son by the name of Lamech. And this is a case where the root is still available to us in our English. The, the, the root there, uh, we see it in lament or lamentation. And Lamech is, means despairing. It's a root that implies despairing. And Lamech has a son by the name of Noah. How many of you have heard of Noah? I have about 60%, Graham. That's great. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding, of course. Okay, Noah. So it's, a, uh, it's derived from the Hebrew word nacham, which means to bring relief or comfort. In fact, um, the comfort or rest is what the term implies. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, he, uh, his father tell, uh, he says, he calls his name Noah, saying, the same shall comfort us. The name Noah means comfort or rest. Okay, so you've been with me so far. We have a genealogy here then of 10 people. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. That's, let's not transliterate it, let's translate it. What do those names mean? Well, Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalalel means the blessed God. Yared means shall come down. Enoch, teaching. Methuselah, his death shall bring. Lamech, the despairing. And Noah, comfort or rest. Man's appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring. Whose death? God's death. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring 
the despairing comforter rest. Wow, every time I do this, I get goosebumps. Now there's no way, this has several implications. There's no way you'll ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis conspired to hide a summary of the New Testament Christian gospel in a genealogy in the Torah? No way. This also tells you that God's plan for man was not a knee-jerk reaction to a surprise. He and the Son planned the redemption before the foundation of the earth. Ephesians 1.4 will confirm that to you, and there's other passages, of course. Breathtaking insight by paying attention to the text. I've studied the Bible for about 65 years, and every t- all through those years, I often had to change my views as I learned more. But in summarizing all that, I was stunned to realize that every time I had to change my views about the text, it was always in the direction of taking it more seriously than before. I've be, as an information scientist, I've now learned that the key is precision. Be precise with words. You sometimes have to be even more precise than your translators were. You need to do a little bit of homework. One integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. It's one book. I often threaten to have a, have a conference where we're going to tear the page out in the Bible that's unnecessary. And that'll bring out all the fundamentalists. And then with great ceremony, we'll open the book and tear out the page between the Old and New Testament. It's one book. 66 books but penned by a single author. Well, we talked about the flood when it started. Let me change subjects on you a little bit. When did the flood end? We all know what the flood of Noah in chapter 6 and 7 and so on. When you get to chapter 8, verse 4, we have an interesting verse. It says, The ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, and on the mountains of Ararat. Now, if, you've been a, if you're a normal person, when you read something like that, you just keep reading and go on. But if you've been to one of my Bible studies, you're no, you are no longer a normal, well-adjusted person. Because you'll remember that I have this peculiar view that everything in the Scripture is there deliberately. The Holy Spirit had a reason. Okay, well, why did the Holy Spirit want you to know the, this very date? The date that the ark finally, after the flood, comes to rest. It tells you that it's the 17th day of the seventh month. Well, that's, uh, you have to understand a little background to follow this. You're going to have to know that the Jews have two calendars. The Genesis calendar, it starts with the first of Tishri in the fall. That's Rosh Hashanah, the head of the new year. Their new year starts typically in our fall. That's we'll call that the Genesis calendar, which is the one that's referred to in Genesis chapter 8. But when you get to the book of Exodus, you have the Passover introduced. And, you, and the Lord says, when he introduces Passover, he says, this month, the month of Nisan, shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So suddenly the Jews have two calendars. They have the civil calendar, I'll call it, the one that's the Genesis calendar. That's what the Rosh Hashanah, their new year they celebrate and so forth. Fine. But the religious calendar, the spiritual calendar, starts in the spring, the month of Nisan, because it's on the 14th of Nisan that they celebrate Passover. And so so if you look at this, you realize that the, the, the month that is the uh, uh, first month of the Exodus calendar is the month of Nisan, which is the seventh month of the Genesis calendar. Well, with that insight now, you look at this, that month of Nisan, we notice, we talk about beginnings, we know that Jesus was crucified on Passover. He was the Passover, and, he was, and those were fulfilled on that day. So we have crucified, he was crucified on the 14th of Nisan. How long was he in the grave? How many, how many was it? Anyone? Three days. We agree on that? Okay. Well, that means he resurrected then on the 17th of Nisan, right? But wait a minute. That was the 17th day of the seventh month. Connect the dots on this now. Noah's new beginning on the planet Earth was on the anniversary in advance of our new beginning in Christ. Now, you can shrug that off as a coincidence, except there are hundreds of them all through the Scripture. And that's why to a, to a Greek mind, like yours and mine if we're Gentile, is prophecy is a prediction and a fulfillment, a prediction and a fulfillment, not to the Hebrew mind. The Hebrew mind, prophecy is pattern. They're into pattern, and God has a pattern. The Jews' catechism is his calendar, and it's amazing how many things link to that. And so, 
Okay, let me shift gears here a little bit. I was playing with you earlier with the 12 and 13 thing on the slide. I want to talk about the camp of Israel. When you get to Numbers chapter 2, you have all these numbering of the tribes. I'm going to suggest to you that every detail in the scriptures there by deliberate design. Well, what on earth might be hidden behind all these numbers in Numbers chapter 2? You have all these numbers. Jesus said, the volume of the book is written of me. He says that in Psalm 40, verse 7. It's quoted in Hebrews also. And so, let's take a look at this. Well, when you go through Numbers chapter 2, you discover that Judah was 74,600, the type of Issachar. They're numbering people over, the males only, over 25. But anyway, setting that aside, Judah is 74,600, Issachar 54,4. And uh, we discover that the 12 tribes are clustered into four camps. And, uh, but let's just go through these numbers, and I won't do, go all the details. The point is, they're all in Numbers chapter 2. And as you go through these and look them over, there they are. And you say, so what on earth, why are these numbers in your Bible? Let me tell you another secret. God always rewards the diligent. If you're paying attention to Numbers chapter 2 carefully, you know that the 12 tribes are clustered into four camps. Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun together become the camp of Judah. Reuben, Simeon, and Gad become the camp of Reuben. Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin become the camp of Ephraim, and Dan, Asher, and Naphtali, the, tribe of Dan, uh, the camp of Dan. So the nation was grouped into four camps. And then when we look at that and tally them, we have a glimpse of those four camps. So far, are you with me? Let's notice something else as we go here. You notice those are 12 tribes without Levi. Levi was separated. You see, there's 13 tribes you can choose from. You always have to get a baker's dozen, so you've got a spare here. The, the Levites camped in the middle. There was the tabernacle. We always have the bottom of the map that the, uh, with east at the bottom, north to the right, west, and so forth. And in there we have the Levites, the three families, the, Kohathite, the Gershonites, Kohathites, and uh, Merites are on the west, south, and north side of the tabernacle. Then at the east side, you have Moses and the priests. So that was the way the Levites, including Moses and the priests, camped. We don't know how much space were required by them, but whatever it is is going to be our unit. So whatever space that is, it is, that's the space, because you'll see what, where I'm headed here. You've got you to give them credit. They really tried very hard to follow the law. And what the Torah says is the camp of Judah is to be east of the Levites. Okay. And the camp of Reuben is to be south of the Levites. And so on. When you examine that carefully, you realize that, 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 to be really strict here, what do you do with the area that's southeast? It's neither south nor east. Okay. So what do you do with that? I'm going to suggest to you that if you follow the Torah's instruction, you only can use the ordinal points of the compass. And the width of the camp for Levi is the basic unit you're going to use. And the length of the arm will be proportional to the population. So let's take a look at this. Right in the middle, we have the Levites, and they add up to about 22,000 as a total. We have Judah to the south, but they, or to the east, I mean. And the, tri the emblem of the tribe of Judah was the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. That was, all 12 tribes had an uh, ensign. But Judah was to be the head of the camp of Judah. And so that's they all camped, but they could only camp as wide as the Levites if they're going to stay east of the Levites. They can't get wider than that, or they're no longer east of the Levites. You following me so far? Okay, and they, they would take then as much space as they needed. Reuben is to the south. His, his symbol happened to be the man, a man, and that was his ensign, and he could, he could only camp as wide as the Levite's camp was to, if he's going to be uh, uh, south of there. And then he goes as far as he needs. And then, of course, it, see, the people down here in this space that's southeast is neither south or east, so it's not camped. You're following me? That's, that's overlooked by most people unless you look at the text very carefully. Well, to, so the, the southeast, southwest, north, those are for, you know, forbidden areas. To the, to the uh, west, we have Ephraim and his three to make the camp of Ephraim, and his symbol was the ox, a symbol of servanthood, if you will. And then, of course, to the north, we have the tribe of Dan. 
Now, the tribe of Dan originally had the symbol of the serpent in Genesis 49. But Ahazer didn't like that, so he changed the symbol to an eagle with a serpent in its mouth. And that becomes the symbol, or the ensign, if you will, of the tribe of Dan. Many people fumble on that by not knowing that little detail. But the point is, his symbol was, of course, the eagle. And that's well documented through your text. And again, he would to be north. He can only be north. The only part that's north of it can only be as wide as the camp of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Levites. So now we have a problem because we've got populations that are different. Okay, Judah is 186,000, and and uh, uh, both Reuben and uh, uh, Dan about 150 some odd, and then Ephraim has only 108. So let's get in our imaginary helicopter that's also a time machine. We'll go back to the time of the wilderness wanderings, what have you, and we'll take a look at what this looked like from the air. Isn't that interesting? That when the camp of Israel, was, the, the nation was encamped, when Balaam was up on the top of the hill for, King, for Balak, that's what he saw. And the, the, the longest one being on the east, that's the population of the camp of Judah. The smallest one to, you know, to the west, which is the camp of Ephraim. The other two are roughly the same size. You can take your Bible and make your own scale drawing for this and come to your own conclusions. But you've got a sketch, an aerial, aerial view of the, of the camp of Israel in your Bible. It's called Numbers chapter 2. To get some paper and try that when you get home. Something else, by the way, of the 12 tribes, four of them, ensigns were used as the four camps, and we have the lion, the man, the ox, and the eagle, and we recognize that right away as the four faces of the cherubim in both the seraphim in Isaiah 6 and the seraphim in uh, the uh, cherubim in uh, uh, Ezekiel 1 and 10 and certainly in Revelation 4 and 5 and on. So uh, you can run with that one if you like. But they apparently, when they were encamped, were making a model of the throne of God. The throne of God. In fact, those same four things, if you look at the design of the Gospels, we know that Matthew's Gospel is designed to present him as the Mashiach, the Messiah, the, the King of Judah. Uh, Mark has no genealogy. He's, he, he's, he's, uh, we don't care about the pedigree of the servant. Luke emphasizes his manhood, the Son of Man, and John, of course, his deity, the Son of God. And so uh, they have genealogies that are proportional to that. Matthew's genealogy starts with the first Jew, Abraham. Luke starts with Adam and co- goes to the end. And Mark doesn't deal with genealogies because he's dealing with his servanthood. You don't worry about the pedigree of the servant. John has a genealogy in his gospel, but you don't recognize it because it's the genealogy of the pre-existent one in the first three verses. And uh, as we move on, then, we have Matthew, what Jesus, what Jesus said, Mark's the shooting script for Peter. It's a, what, Jesus, what he did. Luke gives us his humanity. You feel how he felt. And then, of course, John, who he really was. And so, uh, and they reach right to a distinctive audience. And uh, they each... Uh, the miracle, the first miracle fits that model, and the, uh, the each end, uh, Matthew with the resurrection, of course, is Mark with the ascension. Luke sets up his sequel book, Luke volume 2, called the Book of Acts, for the promise of the Spirit. John sets up his sequel in his thing called the Revelation. I, I believe his gospel was written before, after the Patmos experience. But uh, each one of these were recognized by the early church as being represented by the four faces of the cherubim. The lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. The same uh, uh, signatures, if you will, that surround the camp when they're encamped. So those are things that you can take a look at and come to your own conclusions. But um, so, again, uh, we have the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. In one book, if you will. Well, we've been talking about serpents. We talked about the strange thing. He had changed his, the, the serpent to, a, uh, to an eagle. Uh, when you get to Numbers 21, a very strange event occurs. And uh, the uh, people were upset with God, God and against Moses because all, God had sent these, these uh, fiery sp- uh, serpents. Fiery because they, uh, uh, it's a way of describing a poisonous serpent from the burning effects of the, of the poison. But these serpents were killing people, and God, Moses went to God, and God said, uh, 
uh, uh, people came to Moses, of course, and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord, and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And so Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. So we have this strange event. They're to make a serpent out of brass, put it on a pole on top of a hill, everybody that looks to that would be healed. Now, that's, it's funny how God always uses these strange remedies. And uh, so, uh, why? Why did God do that? Nowhere in the Old Testament is that explained. Nowhere is, why, why that peculiar remedy? And uh, it's a serpent of brass, okay, which is uh, copper or bronze, technically, but okay. And uh, so, and everybody that looked to it lived. What a strange remedy. A serpent, isn't that a figure for sin or evil? Why is that doing here? And why brass? Well, that's the metal that could stain fire, so Leviticus, it, it's sort of idi- idiomatic of a judgment. A judgment. And you can search the entire Old Testament and not ha- find an explanation of that anywhere. In fact, it proves to be a nemesis. When you, a thousand years later, when we get to the, day, the days of Hezekiah. They're worshiping this thing. It's still around in 2 Kings 18. See, Hezekiah was a good guy. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He removed the high place and so forth. But in those days, the children of Israel did burn incense to this thing. And so Hezekiah says, calls it Nehushtan, a thing of brass. He destroys it because they're worshiping it like a fetish or something. A piece of brass. You know, it's interesting, from that event, back in Numbers 21, we get some legends in Greek mythology and elsewhere that lead to the rod of Aesculapius which is a symbol for medicine, as you've seen on license plates and, and, and in, in logos and so forth. In America, it's kind of funny because they, whoever picked the, cor- the, the its emblem inadvertently didn't pick the emblem of Aesculapius. He picked the wand of Hermes, which is two of these. That's the symbol for the god of commerce. I'm always amused when I see a doctor with that on his license plate that he's, 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 he's showing an allegiance to the God of commerce rather than the God of healing. But he may not be sensitive to the difference between the Caduceus and the Escalapius. But we'll go on here. The real question is, why is this in the Old Testament? 1 Corinthians 10 tells us, Now all these things happen to them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The word examples there in the Greek is tupos, or type. It's a type. It's an anticipatory type. And we don't see any explanation of this until Nicodemus meets Jesus Christ that night. When you get to John chapter 3, I see all this is a, it's a pattern, it's a, it's a prefiguring, if you will. And in the New Testament, Jesus explains to Nicodemus, as, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And Jesus announces that this was an anticipatory symbol or type back in Numbers 21. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So Jesus is building a type on that Numbers 21 event that he identifies himself with in John chapter 3. In fact, not only that, it leads to the most famous Bible verse in the entire Bible. Because he goes on and he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Most famous Bible verse is Jesus' response to his explanation in Numbers 21. So it's interesting that, you know, there's a, in in Matthew 22, the enemies of Israel attack him, the Herodians have their attack on him, the Sadducees have their attack on him, and then the Pharisees have their attack on him. And he says, okay, you guys are asking me questions. Can I ask you a question? Well, well, sure, okay. So he says, and when the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they said unto him, The son of David. You know, they, they got that part right, okay. He said unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, and then he quotes the first verse of Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And it's interesting, they, when you're dealing with lawyers, you've got to have to do your homework. And Jesus are dealing with lawyers here, right? 
And he, he asked them a question, and they could not answer it. In fact, I love the last verse of Matthew 22. And it says, uh, No man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. I love that. Now, see, you and I read that in Matthew 22. We, not, we, we don't get the full impact unless you look at the Hebrew more carefully. Let's take a look at what Jesus, son of, the fact that he's son of David, that's all through the Bible. You can chase that down in your notes, no problem. And in fact, uh, Proverbs 30, verse 4, it says, who, sh- who ascended up to heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Here's another allusion to Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. But anyway, um, the, let's take a look at what uh, Jesus said in Psalm of David. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I have made thine enemies thy footstool. That's the way we see it in our King James. Let's take a look at the Hebrew. But so Hebrew goes from right to left. Okay, and so as we look at this, we recognize the yod heh vav the word for the un- unpronounceable name of God. Then right after that we have Adonai, the word for Lord. But you see, the whole thing, the reason they couldn't answer him was because at the, at the left end of that, at the end of that word, there is a yod. That little yod is one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet that you and I would mistake for a blemish on the paper. It looks like an apostrophe or something. But what that does to the word Adonai, it makes it possessive. The Lord said unto my Lord. See, it's that possessiveness they could not deal with. And, because, uh, uh, and so uh, um, we picked that up. Now, why am I making such a big thing of this? Because Jesus in the Sermon on the Mountain says, Think not that I come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. A yacht or a tittle. That's a Hebraism. In English, we might say, Not the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T will pass from law. This is a call by the Lord Jesus, to take the text seriously, precisely. And one of the things I've learned uh, throughout the 65 years I've studied is that, le- that God means what he says and says what he means, and you have a high respect for the text. And uh, he always honors that. One yard or one tittle, taken very seriously. And so that's why these lawyers, no man was able to answer him a word, neither just any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. I love that. I love that. And so we see the same kind of thing every Christmas. We always get a Christmas card, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. A child is born, and a son is given. Those are not synonymous. You think that's synonymous? You haven't done your homework. A child is born as human. A son is given is divine. The son, the child is born, that was fulfilled in a place called Bethlehem. The son is given. Occurred in a place called Golgotha. And of the increase of his government there should be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts had performed this upon the throne of David. Boy, there are people that need to go back who claim they believe their Bible to better figure out what that throne of David is really all about. We'll move on here. We use the term gospel all the time. How many of you can tell me what the gospel is and be careful? Well, it's the good news. That's a cliche. Metaphors reign where mysteries reside. What is the gospel? Paul tells us, by the way, in the first four verses of 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. I declare unto you the gospel. He's going to define the gospel for us here. And by the way, you can believe in vain. Think about that a little bit, but we'll move on here. What is the gospel? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's His definition of the gospel. Do you notice the things that He did not mention? didn't mention His miracles. 
didn't mention his teachings or his examples. No, no, the gospel are those three things, period. Okay, first, that he died for our sins according to scriptures. We just talked about that a little bit, highlighted in a previous example. And that he was buried, only uh, Paul makes emphasis on that. It relates this to baptism. Peter makes a declared, relates it to Noah's flood. But then the, the third thing is that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus predicted that specifically in John 2 and Matthew 27. But it's interesting, Paul highlights that this was according to the scriptures. When he says scriptures, he means the Old Testament at this point, right? Where in the Old Testament does it say he's going to be in the tomb three days? Well, there's a number of places. Jonah Rahab's cord, the Tola worm, and the Akedah, the offering of Isaac. Now, Jonah is pretty straightforward. We'll take a look at that. You all know in Matthew 12, 40, Jesus himself said, as for as Jonah's was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we get that one pretty quickly. We remember that. But there's probably not many of you in here that may have discovered the little secret that's tucked away in, in Rahab's comments to the t- protecting the two spies in Joshua chapter 2. Strange little story. In Joshua, in Joshua chapter 2, these two spies have been able to hide in Rahab's place. She's on the wall. She let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was up on the town wall, and she dwelt upon the town wall. And the scripture here, where it uses the word cord in the Hebrew, happens to use the word hebel. Hebel obviously can mean a rope or a cord. It also is a word that can mean pain, sorrow, or travail. It's a pun, if you will. Okay, fair enough. When you get down to verse 18, they say to her in response, Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou hast let down by, and thou shalt bring thy father, thy mother, and thy brethren, and all thy father's household come to thee. In other words, for shielding us, we'll protect your house. So this cord that you're using, tie it on the window, and when we take over Jericho, our troops will protect you and your family as an accommodation. You get the picture. Except what they, when they use this term, the, the Holy Spirit here ha- records the word line here. It isn't the word hebel. It uses a, t- a different word. It uses the word tikva. Now, tikva can obviously mean a line or a cord, but it also has another meaning. The word tikva means hope. Ha tikva is the national anthem of Israel. It means the hope or expectation, if you will. Well, that's pretty interesting. Okay, so what are you making that, Chuck? You're making something out of nothing. No, look between these two verses, between 15 and 18 is verse 16. She says to them, Get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may you go your way. In other words, there's going to be a search on. So she advises them when they get down the wall to go hide in the mountains. Don't go back to the camp. And wait till the search is over and then go home. And she says you should, wait, you should hide in the mountains three days. Why not four or two? But she picked three. Did she know why? I don't know. Holy Spirit saw that she did. Why? Well, I'll show you why. See, hebel can mean rope or cord or pain, sorrow, and travail. Tikva can mean the same thing in terms of a rope or a cord, but its pun, the other word is a little different. So instead of the primary use of each of these words, let's shift to the alternative pun value of each one of these. And obviously, she puts in three days between the two. Really? Okay. Pain, sorrow, travail, what's the ultimate one of those? The cross. What's the ultimate hope? The empty tomb. How much space is between Hebel and Tikva? Is three days between the cross and the empty tomb. Now some of you may say, Chuck, you're making something out of nothing. Okay, I'll yield if you feel that way. It gives me chills because I suddenly discover many hundreds of places where the Holy Spirit has edited the text to give us an, an additional meeting. And I'll, I'll take, give you an example of that in, the, in the, one of the other sessions. Jesus, he hangs on the cross, according to Psalm 22, which reads as if he dictated while hanging on the cross, says a, he says a strange thing while he's hanging on the cross. Jesus says, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despise of the people. What on earth is Jesus talking about when he calls himself a worm? The word, the word in the Hebrew is tola, which means word. It also is a word meaning scarlet. It means, or crimson, if you will, 38 times is tra- translated crimson. 
The scarlet dye in Israel was made from a particular worm called the Sermus vermilio, and it has a very interesting life cycle. It pierces the thin bark of twigs to suck the sap from which it prepares a waxy scale to protect its soft body. The red dye is in that scale. When reproducing, the female climbs a tree, usually a home or oak, where it bears the eggs and its larvae hatch and feed on the body of the worm. It gives its life, if you will, for them. A crimson spot is left on the branch. When the scarlet spot dries out in three days, it changes to white as it flakes off. Jesus says, I'm a worm. And no man. That's what Isaiah points out to you in Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your skins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Praise his holy name. There's another one, the Akhidah, but I'll leave that to the next session. But as the three days and three nights, if you've done your homework, you realize that there were three days and three nights, which tells you, by the way, I'm sorry if it offends anybody, but we at least, we hold the view that the, the, the uh, crucifixion could not have been on a Friday. With all due respect to the church traditions, it could not possibly have been for a lot of reasons. And uh, in, in Matthew 28, verse 1, there's an error in your English. In the Greek, it's very, very clear. At the end of the Sabbath's plural, and that means that, uh, that uh, there were two, at least two Sabbaths that week. And indeed there were the Feast of Unleavened Bread as well as Shabbat on, on uh, Saturday. And of course the resurrection did occur at, sun, at, uh, 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 at, the, at the sundown and, and uh, discovered of course on Sunday. The Feast of First Fruits. As the Feast of First Fruits were being celebrated at the temple, some girls were finding, discovering the empty tomb that morning. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ obviously is the key to the gospel, as Paul points out. It's the key, the key belief that separates us from others. He, he was raised for our justification, Romans tells us. Without the resurrection, our faith is vain, Paul tells us. It's a prerequisite to being an apostle, by the way. It's a key truth. It was Peter at Pentecost who points it out, the apostles at Solomon's porch, and before the Sanhedrin, and of course, proclaimed as Gentiles. It's astonishing to see how fundamental that is to the church and how rare it is preached from the pulpits. So the joint actions, every major action by God is attributed to three people. The incarnation is in Hebrews 10 is attributed to the Father and Philippians 2 to the Son and Luke 1, the Holy Spirit. The atonement is attributed to the Father in Isaiah 53, to the Son in Ephesians 5 and to the Holy Spirit in Hebrews 9. And then the resurrection in Romans 5 to the Father, and John 10 to the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's interesting how these three things point to the Trinity throughout the Bible. They were equal in nature, separate in person, and subservient in duties. Praise God. Praise His holy name. Koinonia House is a nonprofit Christian ministry that is supported by the purchasing of materials and donations. To learn more about Koinonia House and the materials that we have available, visit khouse.org. And please be responsible in the sharing and dissemination of this information and respect the copyrights therein. Thank you. Koinonia House is a nonprofit Christian ministry that is supported by the purchasing of materials and donations. To learn more about Koinonia House and the materials that we have available, visit khouse.org. And please be responsible in the sharing and dissemination of this information and respect the copyrights therein. Thank you. Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for bringing us together. And we do pray, Father, that your spirit would open our hearts and lives to how you would best use us in the days ahead as we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, our Lord Jesus, our Messiah indeed. Amen. Well, we're in the second part of some of these explorations of what I call uh, hidden treasures in the biblical text. But I'd like to pause with a little exercise. I want you at least 
uh, in your imagination, assume you have a pad in front of you, and I want to talk a little bit about sevens in the Bible. And uh, they occur in over 600 passages. I probably should have said 700. <laughs> uh, some are very overt. Some are structural. You really have to, look, and some of them are even hidden. But the, the sevens are everywhere. In fact, there's a discovery that I want to touch on about called the heptatic structure uh, of the, the, the uh, Bible. I want you to uh, imagine a challenge. Imagine yourself being assigned in that classroom context with a blank sheet of paper. And what I want you to imagine, you don't have to literally do it, but I want you in your mind's eye to accept an assignment to create a genealogy. You can do it from fiction if you like. Um, and, but I want the number of words that you're going to end up using to be divisible by seven. In other words, if you take, well, however, when you finish making your little genealogy, if you count the words and divide by seven, there should be no remainder. And I, and I, was, I want you to have your, your assignment a multiple of seven exactly. How many could do that? That's not hard to do, especially in English. You can fudge it around, okay. Except I got another uh, uh, condition I want you to meet. I want the number of letters that you use, if you count them up, to be div divisible by seven exactly. Now that's a little tougher, isn't it? Because you might get the words to come out, but you need to get the letters to come out. But by fudging around, you could probably do that. Except I, have an, I want the number of vowels and the number of constants each to be a num multiple of seven. How many are still playing with me? <laughs> okay, well, I've got some additional rules I want your assignment to meet. I want the number of words that begin with a vowel to be divisible by seven. I want the number of words that begin with a consonant to be divisible by seven. And I have some other things. I want the number of words that occur more than once to be a multiple of seven exactly. And I'd like to have those that occur in more than one form to be divisible by seven. And those that are in only one form divisible by seven. How many are still playing? Okay. You realize every time I impose another sevenfold rule, you've got six chances of losing and one of winning just by randomness. You with me? Okay. The number of nouns should be divisible by seven. Only seven words won't be nouns. And the number of names should be divisible by seven. Only seven other kinds of nouns are permitted. Anyone still playing? Okay. And so what you probably, some other things here, the number of male names divisible by seven, number of generations, and you've probably guessed what I'm doing here. I'm describing to you the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the first 11 verses of the Gospel of Matthew. They meet all those rules. Now you can't imagine doing that yourself. And I'm talking about Greek, which is rigid. Every Greek verb has to meet five conditions. It's much more structured than our English that we're used to. And uh, so the, the, the precision, the, the, what I'm trying to get across is that we discover as you investigate the text, it has properties that are not simulatable. Trying to do that even with the aid of a computer is a ver almost impossible task. See, Greek also is one of the two languages, there's two languages that have a numerical value for every letter in their alphabet. Hebrew and Greek have that peculiar characteristic. That means that every word has a value. They call it the geometrical value. And we could go through this of the rest of chapter one and find it still obeys dozens of these sevenfold challenges. I won't go through them all here, but almost every characteristic you measure turns out to be a number that's an exact multiple of seven. Now, the child of Christ in Matthew 2, same also fits all of that, and, and we could go on and on about this. The chances of these things happening by statistical ac accident are phenomenally unlikely. If I just have two of these, if I have one uh, rule of seven, you've got six chances of losing, one of winning, right? But if I have two rules, that's one chance in seven squared, or 49. In other words, you have by randomness, you have one chance in 49 of it coming out the way you want it. You with me? And if I have three of those, it's one chance in 343. See, it's always the, the exponent of the number you're looking at. And so if I have four, it's two, 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 it's, you have one chance in 2,400 of getting it by just statistical accident. And so if, if you go down this list, I've given you nine rules so far. Those nine rules mean that you have one chance in 40 million of having it come out right by just statistical accident. 
I you know, want you to understand the, the, the statistical behavior. The more rules there are, the more unlikely it is to come about by anything other than deliberate design. And so, and uh, if you'd like to try this, let's assume you say, well, I can try to do that. If I've got to do that, if I worked eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, that's 2,000 man hours a year in effect, and uh, in seven to nine chances means I've got to have 40 million attempts to try to get it by randomness. If I can do, it takes 10 minutes at a time to write one of these genealogies, then uh, it, 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 that would take 400 uh, million minutes or over 3,000 years. But it gets worse than that. That's just a quick approximation. Let's look at further. If I go on with these words, these, these rules, it turns out that I can give you actually 34 of these. And that's one chance in oodles. <laughs> okay. And so, if you still want to try doing this mechanically, and that means you got 7 to the 34th power, that's 5 times 10 to the 25th tries would be needed, and there are 3 times 10 to the 7th tries, uh, seconds per year. Let's assume you had a supercomputer that would do 400 million of these per second. How long would it have to work? It still would have to work over 4 times 10 to the 12th computer years. In other words, I, if it had a million of these supercomputers, it still would take over 4 million years. I think it's a cross that it's not the li this is not something that could happen by randomness. And uh, so, and this was only with 34. Dr. Ivan Panin, on whose research this, who discovered these things, he identified 75, not 34 rules, and that goes beyond our imagining. Dr. I uh, Ivan Panin, born in Russia back in 1955, ex exiled at an early age, he got involved in a plot against the Tsar, emigrated to Germany and then the U.S. He graduated from Harvard in 1882. And interestingly enough, he discovered Christ. Now, every one of us in this room that has discovered Christ are the result of a miracle. But if you've got a PhD in, from Harvard, that's a bigger miracle. Okay. <laughs> and so, but he also discovered early in his career the, the, what he calls the heptatic structure of the scripture. And back in 1890, actually. He committed the rest of his 50 years of his life generating over 43,000 pages of discoveries. Very dry reading, but staggering in their implications. What you, because it, uh, among other things, it tells you there are all kinds of properties of the Torah that depend on the precise letters that you're using, which tells you not only did God give Moses the Torah, he gave it to Moses letter by letter. You pull one letter out of that and some of those properties start to dissipate. Staggering, staggering implication to an information scientist. And so, but I want to mention just one of these that to me is the most staggering of them all. The New Testament consists of 27 books. That means they, they have a word that starts them and a word that ends them. And if there's 27 books of the New Testament, then you've got uh, 54 words, okay? And so there's a total vocabulary of those words that happen to be uh, 28 words in the Gospels. And uh, so if you go through all this arithmetic, the shortest word, the longest word, all that sort of thing, each one of those are multiple of seven. But here's the one that's interesting to me. The vocabulary in the Gospel of Matthew that is unique to the Gospel of Matthew happens to be a multiple of seven. It occurs 42 times, that's seven times six. It has a 226 letters, that's seven times 18. And that's un the only property that these words have is that they are unique to the Gospel of Matthew. And they come out precisely as a multiple of seven. You with me so far? My question is, gee, that's interesting. Um, how could that have been organized? Let's imagine that Matthew deliberately tried to make it come out that way. How would you go about doing that? There's only two ways you could do that. One is you could have all the other authors of the New Testament agree not to use those, those words. How many think that happened? I don't think so. Well, the other way, you could use that argument linguistically to prove that Matthew must have written his last. That's the only way he could preserve that property, right? So I could use that as an argument, at least, that Matthew wrote his document last. 
And that's pretty interesting. So Gospel of Matthew wrote his last, except I discover that when I look at the Gospel of Mark, it has the same property. That the words that are unique to the Gospel of Mark are a multiple of seven exactly. That proves that Mark was written last. Well, no, wait a minute. If I look at the Gospel of Luke, it also has that property. That the words that are unique to his writing in the New Testament, those words, there's the, the number of words that are unique to him are a multiple of seven exactly. That proves that Luke wrote his last, except so did John. Each one of these wrote theirs last. In fact, so did James, Peter, Jude, and Paul. Each wrote last. Each one of their writings, the collective writings, has a vocabulary unique to them. Staggering. Staggering. You can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can. The more you know about the information sciences, the more you discover that we're dealing with something that is supernatural. That is supernatural. In Hosea, God reveals something. He says, I've also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions, and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Use similitudes. There are, par- there are figures of speech. There are rhetorical devices used in the Bible. Often on a radio show and so forth, I, I would get some antagonist to challenge me on the radio on something, and, and uh, uh, I, I, was, I, I, I was about to come back and say, you know, I take the Bible literally. But I knew the minute I said that, he would say, well, then you think that God has feathers because of Psalm 91, under his wings I shall tread. So I, I, as I started to answer the guy, instead of saying literally, I said, for some reason... Maybe I was tired. Maybe it was the Holy Spirit operating. I says, I take it seriously. And the other guy on the other end of the line got so upset, I knew I'd struck gold. Because he didn't want to get down, you know, he wanted to go down the literal argument, which is uh, 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 an argument from naivete, actually. But I I take it seriously. See, there are figures of speech in the Bible. Do you know how many different kinds there are? How many different rhetorical devices are, are used in the Bible? Well, there's similes, allegories, analogies. You can make a list. You can make a list of over 200, and they're all cataloged for you in the appendix to some of our materials back there, for, for if you're interested in that. Use similitudes. The Lord uses similitudes. We saw one in the last session how the Holy Spirit used puns with Hebel and Tikva to get across a, a, a thing. There are figures of speech. There are similes, of course, allegories, metaphors, uh, types. We talk typos and uh, analogy, and, of course, hypercatastasis. There's 200 of these things. But more to the point, um, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, now all these things happen in them for examples and were written for our admission. Now the word examples there in the Greek is tupos, which, from which we get the word type, like a prototype, if you will. And so there are types, and that, those are very, very important. They, they express a pattern. That's the Hebrew concept of, of prophecy is patterns. And we're going to explore the classic one in the Bible, I saved it for this one because I didn't want it. I, I didn't try to squeeze it in the last session. I'll put it in here. The offering of Isaac. We all know the story, I assume. The Hebrew term for that event is called the Akedah, the offering of Isaac. And it shocks many people when they read their Bible that it would seem that God is admi- admonishing child sacrifice. Because we always have the Sunday school mentality that there's this little kid going up the hill with Abraham. Well, let's take a look at this a little bit. And it uh, came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, said, uh, Abraham, he said, Behold, here I am. He said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. By the time you get to Genesis 22, Abraham had learned his lesson. That's what God said. So the next morning he's off to do just that, to offer his son. Wow. By the way, there's also a law in among expositors called the law of first mention. When you find a place in the Bible that a subject comes up the first time, you generally discover it's a very significant one. This is the first place that the word love appears in the Bible, is the Abraham offering his son. And uh, we'll see why that's so significant here shortly. The next morning, Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him. There's four people now, Abraham, Isaac, and two young men and the donkey. And, and the son, and they clave the word for the burnt offering, and they rose up, and he went unto the place of which God had told him. Now we know from the epistle to Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 19, that as far as Abraham is concerned, his son was dead when the commandment came. As far as Abraham, the commandment came, as far as Abraham is concerned, he reckoned him dead. 
It's a question of just executing what God told them to do. So they travel from Beersheba to Jerusalem. They're down in Beersheba when all this happens. They travel to Jerusalem up to Mount Moriah, if you will. And uh, so that turns out to be a three-day journey. Then on the third day, it's a three-day journey. That's going to be interesting because Isaac will be dead to Abraham for three days, apparently. Lifted up his eyes, he saw a place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. So they leave these two young men at the bottom of the hill with the donkey. Abraham and Isaac go up the hill to worship. And Abraham says, we're going to come back. See, Abraham knew something. He says, he was awfully brave. He's going to offer his son. Abraham's attitude was that's God's problem because God had promised him that Isaac would have children. So if God wants me to kill him, God's got a problem. He's going to have to raise him from the dead because he promised me he's going to have kids. That's his l- very logical. So he's telling the young man, we'll, we'll come back. We're coming. I'm going to offer him there, but we're going to come back. Really? And Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son and took the fire in his hand and the knife and both, they both went in agreement. So they both together, they went in agreement. What most people don't realize is that this is not a kid that's walking up the hill with his dad. This is a 30-year-old son walking up the hill with his dad. And so, okay, and it's the third day. We will come again to you, he says. Good. And so, and Isaac spake, uh, spake unto Abraham's father and said, Father, he said, Here am I, said my son. He said, Behold the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Good question. They're on the way up the hill. Where, where, where's the lamb? And what does Abraham say to him? You're it. No, no, not exactly. Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Interesting. I always thought this was a stall to the kid until they got up there. No, look what he said, Abraham says. God will provide who? Himself. Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy because he names the place in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. He may not have known the details that 2,000 years later on that very spot another father would offer his son as an offering for sin, the ultimate one. Wow, it gets better. They came to the place where God had told him of. Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid upon him, upon the altar, the wood. And he stretched forth his hand and took the knife. He's ready to do it. And of course, you know the story. He gets interrupted. They substitute a ram. Where is this happening? Well, if you look at the top of the map, the, the, uh, Mount, uh, Mount Moriah is a ridge system going from south to north. And uh, there's a mount to the left, uh, to, uh, to the west, called Mount Zion. There's a valley that used to be there, the Tropian Valley. It's been filled since. And uh, you go to the east, there's a Kedron Valley. And uh, on, on the other side of that is the mount, mount of Olives. And so it's a ridge between two mountains. To the south, there's another valley, the Hinnom Valley. And so uh, Salem the, the, is at the base. It's about 600 meters above sea level. But as you go up that ridge, you're going increased altitude until you get to the thrashing floor of Aruna, which is later purchased by David to be the, pr- the site of the temple. But that's hundreds of years later. The peak of that place is uh, uh, the, the Akadiatik's place at the peak, which is uh, the thrashing floor of Aruna is about 741 meters. It's another 30 meters higher you get to the peak called uh, Let's look at this a little bigger. And that's the place that we call Golgotha. And so the angel of the Lord called him out of the heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here am I. He says, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him. For now I know that thou fearest God, that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So you know the story. Let's table this for a moment. I'll come back to it. In the next two chapters later, Abraham again has an errand for his business partner, his servant. You don't find his name in that chapter. But by doing some homework, you find out what his name was. His name happened to be Eliezer, which means comforter. And so he commissions Eliezer to gather a bride for Isaac. He sends him to the, to the old country, to Laban. Eliezer qualifies the gal by a well. She agrees to marry a bridegroom she hasn't met. And he gives her gifts and so forth and brings her back. Uh, and and, and she, he, she joins her bridegroom by the well of Lahai Roy, 
that all occurs in chapter 24. We were in chapter 22, in chapter 24. I want you to get that perspective, okay? Because again, we have Abraham in a type of the Father, Eliezer in a type of the Holy Spirit, and uh, Isaac in the type, as a type of the bridegroom, the son, and uh, Rebecca will turn out to be the bride. Again, it's a type, it's a, a, a foreshadowing, if you, if you follow me. But we can learn something interesting from this. A- Abraham's the father, Isaac the son, Eliezer the Holy Spirit, sent to gather a bride for the son. Praise God. Let's go back, and there's a verse that fascinates me in Genesis 22. Just after they substitute the ram, it says the following in verse 19. Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. In other words, after the episode up there on the mount, Abraham goes down the hill, the two guys are still down there with the donkey, they all go home. Are you with me so far? You notice something missing? Where's Isaac? Now, you and I jump to the conclusion, and it's correct, obviously, Isaac went with him home. Abraham and Isaac went down and joined the two young men and they went home. That's obvious. That's the way we read it and presume that, but we're being presumptuous. Because the Holy Spirit's done something very interesting here. You don't find Isaac's name there. Really. Did he go down the hill? Of course he did. Because they all go home and the story goes on. You with me? But the Holy Spirit's editing this. We discover something when we examine the text very carefully. Where is Isaac? The person of Isaac is edited out of the record from the time he's offered until the time he is united with his bride by the well of the high roy. The Holy Spirit has diddled with the text so that it fits the model. Astonishing. Is God concerned with patterns? Of course he is. He has Moses strike the rock for water. Meribah. The Rephidim, he asks him to speak to the rock, and Moses strikes it again, and because of that, he doesn't get to inherit after 120 years of service. Uh, wow. 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in Midian, and 40 years in the wilderness, and after all of that, he doesn't inherit because he didn't follow the model that God set out because if he'd done it right, the two water deliveries would have mi- would model his first and second coming. Strike, the first struck the first time, not struck the second. Interesting. So we'll move on here. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Praise His holy name. There's another macro study, an overstudy, that I'll try to summarize here because I think it's useful for our purpose here. That's the book of Ruth. A little four-chapter book that's the most elegant love story in literature. It's taught in many secular colleges just as as a perfect example of a love story, but it has huge, huge implications. You have to understand about hermeneutics, hermeneutics being the theory of interpretation. The Western model is prophecy equals prediction plus fulfillment. The Hebrew mind is prophecy is pattern. That's what we call types. And we looked at the, the big type, which we just looked at Genesis, the Akedah in Genesis 22. There's another one here that we want to look at the book of Ruth. And this is, this is in the days of Judges. I want you to get the timing here. This is in the days of Judges. You've got uh, Moses, five books. Joshua, then Judges. We're not at Samuel yet. It's the ultimate love story in the mind of many. At the literary level, and clearly at the prophetic level, I maintain you cannot understand the book of Revelation unless you understand the book of Ruth. And uh, it's one of the most significant books of the Old Testament for the church. How interesting. Old Testament church? Is that a contradiction? No. Because it profiles the role of the kinsman redeemer. And it's a central prerequisite to the book of Revelation to understand that. And uh, it's in four chapters. The first chapter is Love's Resolve, where Ruth insists upon, the Moabitess insists upon clinging to her her mother-in-law. And the second chapter about how she regathers uh, for them, as, as, as widows and orphans do. And then Love's Request, a very strange scene in chapter three that most people misunderstand. I'll come back to that. And the final chapter is about the redemption of both the land to Naomi and the bride for for Boaz. In the first chapter, Ruth, in the days of the judges, and the names of all the players are relevant to the story, but in the interest of this summary, I won't get into the details there, just alert you to that so you, you can do the homework on those. They're in your Bible. And so, but the second chapter 
She decides to go back to Bethlehem with Naomi. She's been away for 10 years, but they're destitute. And what they, you have to understand the law of gleaning. There's a couple of laws of the old ancient Israel you need to understand, which is part of the blessing, is the way they had their welfare system. If you owned a, a, a parcel of land, you could reap it once, but what you missed had to be left for the widows and orphans. They, they would glean after the reapers, and they were entitled to do that. So if, uh, Ruth being a, the, uh, t- taking care of Naomi, the, the widow, in fact, they're both widows, um, she gleans, she's able to go after reapers, and she happens to fall upon Boaz's field, which turns out to be the key to the whole plot, of course. That's the provision for the destitute. And she happens on the field of Boaz. I love that because in God, the, you know, the rabbis have an interesting, they say that uh, coincidence is not a kosher word. Or of course we say that you know, there's no accidents in God's kingdom, and this was all predicted. And so Boaz is... Uh, is a wor- name that means in him is strength. How do I know that? Because they named one of the two pillars of the temple after him, uh, Yachin and Bohaz, and that's a whole other story. But the point is, he is introduced to Ruth by an unnamed servant. The Holy Spirit is always acts as an unnamed servant. And Jesus explains that in John 16, that he never, never testifies of himself, never testifies of himself. But we'll go on here. Uh, and Boaz instructs his reapers to leave handful leave handfuls on purpose so the fix is in he's, 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 she's caught his eye obviously Boaz is going to end up becoming the Goel the kinsman redeemer and uh, you have to do, understand this you have to understand the law of redemption and how that worked in uh, Leviticus 25 and also the, um, the uh, law of Leverite marriage the law of redemption was that when you sold a piece of land you sold its use but a, a kinsman could always come back and redeem the land that's what what uh, is operative here. But also, there's a, if, if a husband died without issue, the next of kin could, if he chose to, raise um, an issue to the widow to continue the line. That's called a lever. Levere is, is a, a, a next of kin kind of word. And uh, leverite marriage is, 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 is operative here. And so, in chapter 3, Naomi realized that she that, her, that uh, Ruth has stumbled on a kinsman's land. And she sees an opportunity to, s- to get her land back and also f- to provide a future for Ruth. So she instructs her in exactly what she should do. And so she recognizes the opportunity for the redemption of the land and for a new life for Ruth. So she instructs Ruth on what to do. So that w- we have to understand how, how um, um, thrashing was done. They would there was a, typically a saddleback area where there's a prevailing wind. And what they did was, at, at, they would, at the harvest, they would thrash on that in such a way that the good stuff would fall nearby, but the wind would carry the, the, the chaff further. You'd, if you did it right, you ended up with two piles. The one that's nearby, you'd, be, you'd save for market. The stuff that was further down, you'd burn to keep the vermin away. What they did at the end of the day of all of that, they would celebrate that night with a party. And then the owners would sleep next to the marketable grain to protect it. And uh, uh, that would be the, the thing for the day. She, Naomi told her to watch and watch where Boaz slept after the party, which she does. And as things quiet down, it's all dark. She slips, according to what Naomi, and sleeps at his feet. And he wakes up and discovers there's a woman there. Okay, And so verse 9 is 8 and 9. Widely misunderstood by people who don't have the background. Came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid, and he turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? She answered, I am Ruth, thy handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. Now you and I, without knowledge of that ancient Israel, would, it sounds like she's being, you're propositioning him like a prostitute. No, no, it's worse than that. It's worse than that. Spread. You need to understand the custom. In that culture, your rank in the society was embroidered on the hem of your garment. We think of, of stripes on a sleeve or on a shoulder as evidences of rank. In that culture, it was on the, on the, on the skirt of their... Uh, uh, if you're a Levite, it had a particular indication on, on the edge and so forth. If you were king, David cut the hem off of Saul's thing to prove that he could have killed him that night when they discover he's in the same cave and all that. The next morning, he waves it to prove to Saul that he could have killed him. He didn't. He later regrets it because he felt guilty for having cut off the, the uh, genealogy of the king. It was 
the, the, when, when the woman with the issue of blood pushes through the crowd and tries to touch hems, uh, Jesus, his hem of his garment. That's where she visualized his authority being invested, see? When God speaks to Isaiah that he was going to spread his skirt over the, the nation, uh, spreading his authority, if you will. That's what she's asking him to do, spread his skirt over her, meaning take her to wed as a, as a, as a leveret husband. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. He's eligible to marry her and, and, and perf perform as the goel of the whole thing. So that's the big plot point right here. So she approaches Boaz to fulfill the role of the goel, and he says to her, I'll be glad to do I'd love to do it, except there's somebody that's a closer kinsman. I always visualize if I was setting this up for a movie, you know, I would have uh, Boaz be a, you know, a Charlton Heston or a Russell Crowe kind of guy. And the nearer kinsman would be Danny DeVito or somebody. <laughs> the nearer kinsman's in the way. The next morning, though, Boaz, who is apparently the council chairman, city council, he calls him over and explains that Naomi has a piece of ground and we need a kinsman redeemer. He says, I'll be glad to be the kinsman redeemer. Eh, you don't want to, you'll go away. No. Then Boaz goes, whoever does that also has to take uh, Ruth as wife. That's part of the deal. Because there are four conditions, I'll come to that, to what a goal had to do. He couldn't do that because it would mar his own inheritance, so he passes. And the symbol of passing on the obligation was that he took off his shoe and gave his shoe to Boaz. That was just a symbol of him passing on the opportunity. That was supposed to be being done by Ruth, but Boaz is ac acting as her advocate, if you will, which itself is interesting. And uh, see, for him, that shoe was a mark of disgrace. For Boaz, it was his wedding license. Because that cleared the day for chapter 4, which is the big finish, and that's what I'm heading up for here. So, A little thing occurs at the end of chapter 3 that most readers don't get. Because what, what uh, he says to her, I'll deal with this tomorrow, and he gives her six measures of grain to take back to Naomi. You and I don't know what's going on. Naomi would figure it out because she's Jewish. Because that would mean to her th that he won't rest until it's resolved from, the, from Genesis 1. See, it's a, a, a code of sorts. But anyway, we'll move on here for now. Chapter 4, Boaz confronts the so-called nearer kinsman. He's willing to read from the property, but he's not willing to take Ruth, so he passes on the whole thing. He yields a shoe to relieve the obligation. Then Boaz steps up, and he purchases the land for Naomi, which is the plot problem that started way back in chapter 1. And he purchases, the interesting term, purchases Ruth as a bride. That's where we are. She's a Gentile bride. Did you know that there are seven Gentile brides in the Bible? Did you know that none of them have a death recorded? They obviously died, but it's not recorded. Very interesting, the Holy Spirit, how he plays with this. But then during the festivities, because Boaz is the big hero, he's bought the land for Naomi, he's marrying uh, uh, Ruth, big, big upbeat deal. This is the big finish, right? And somebody says, may your house be like Perez. Now, if you don't know your Bible, it sounds like that sounds like a good thing. If you know your Bible, you'd say, same to you, fella. Because what's this Perez business? Well, you see, you've got to know your Bible because you get there. And we're dealing here, of course, uh, um, Boaz is the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, which means he has to be a kinsman. Get that, that's important. He has to be able to perform. He has to be willing to perform, and he has to assume all the obligations. Those are four conditions of a goel, and Boaz fulfills all four. And it's from this that we understand a great deal about the redemption of Jesus Christ, because he's our goel, he's our kinsman redeemer. What does that mean? And so, he's the Lord of the harvest, he's a kinsman redeemer. Naomi, of course, is the type of Israel, and uh, Ruth is the Gentile bride. Interesting, there's much more to all of this, obviously, but when you get to the book of Revelation... We see chapter 5 open. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? We all know that passage, right? And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. 
had to be a man. You, don't, you and I don't know what's going on, but John did. Because John says, I sobbed convulsively, is what it actually says in the Greek. I, saw, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book and neither to look thereon. It had to be a kinsman of Adam to redeem. It had to be a man. Even Satan couldn't imagine God becoming a man and fulfilling that obligation on our behalf. Wow. Incredible. So John said, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open a book and, read, and to read the book and look thereon. It had to be a man to fill the situation. One of the elders, there's always the elders there that are, are explaining things to him. One of the elders said to me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals of. The lion of the tribe of Judah. That's a man. That's the title of a man. Who is he? You, all, you and I both know who he is. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had. See, the, the tribe of Judah had prevailed and he, he stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven ho- horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God. Those are identities from the first chapter of Re- Revelation of Jesus Christ, of course. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, and the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And on it goes. Wow. Some observations. Let's get back to Ruth again. Okay, Ruth is a type of the church. Naomi, the land of Israel. Israel. In order to bring Ruth to Naomi, Naomi had to be exiled from her land. That's how it all came about. Gee, that's interesting. What the law could not do, grace could. See, it was illegal for Boaz to, ma- ma- to marry a Moabitess. But he did anyway. Ruth does not replace Naomi. Ruth learns of Boaz's ways through Naomi. But Naomi meets uh, Boaz through Ruth. Think that through in the type. Wow! No matter how much Boaz loved Ruth, he had to wait her move. And of course, Boaz, not Ruth, confronts the near his own. He, he steps in as her advocate. And that's Jesus' full-time job as we speak. He's our intercessor. Can you imagine? The book of Ruth in, 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 in um, Jewish terms is always read at the Feast of Pentecost. Why is it always read at the Feast of Pentecost? They have their reasons. We have ours. Because it's Shavuot, that is the Feast of Pentecost, when the church is born. How interesting, that's always when the book of Ruth is being read. And you won't really understand Revelation 5 until you understand the book of Ruth. And you and I are also beneficiaries of of a love story that was written in blood on a wooden cross erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. But we're still not through. This guy at the end of the Ruth, he says, May let your house be like Pharaoh's, whom Tamar bore unto Judah, of the seed of which the Lord shall give thereof this young woman. Now, if you know your Bible, you say, What on earth is that guy? That, is that a toast? No, it's a prophecy. It's not a toast like we would think of in a wedding toast. No, it's a prophecy. There's a law you need to understand. All the laws in there speak of Christ. In Deuteronomy 23, there's a rule that a bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation. So a bastard, and incidentally, you have this strange story where, let's see if I got a summary of that in here, I might have. Um, In Genesis 38, there's this weird, weird story where Judah is tricked into sleeping with his daughter-in-law, thinking she was a pro- an unknown prostitute. She gets pregnant, and he then realizes his sin was greater than hers because he was supposed to provide a, another son for her to marry when the first guy died. And so this weird story is in, in, uh, in Genesis 38. Now, what's the issue here? Well, the point is the illegitimate children are ineligible for inheritance for 10 generations. So let's examine the 10 generations from Perez Hezron, Ram, Amminadab, Nashon, Solomon, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David. David was the 10th generation. 
when Israel's screaming for a king, God had a king in, re- in, in the wings for him. It wasn't, but he wasn't ready yet. So Saul, Saul was a, a patch for their request. In other words, what we also discover that Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and David are encrypted in Genesis 38 in the, in the, in the Torah. And let's see if I can show you that there. The, the whole, it's all about Judas and Tamar. And uh, it, the story of Joseph begins in chapter 37, goes to the end of, to the chapter 50 of Genesis. But right before the, the, this 38, we got this sordid episode. What's that all in there for? Because it preserves the messianic line is what the answer, the rabbis will tell you. And so that's why it's here. But I want you to notice something. This is the Hebrew of Genesis 38. And what we discover tucked away in this at 49 letter intervals is the name Boaz. Well, that's kind of interesting. And then at 49 letter intervals, we also find the name of Ruth. Wow, that's interesting. As we continue through here, we discover at 49 letter intervals, we find Obed. And then at 49 letter intervals again, we find Yishe, or what we would say Jesse. And uh, then we have, at 49 letter intervals again, we have, interestingly enough, David. Let's summarize this. We've got Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse, David, encrypted in the book of Genesis, chapter 38, all at 49 letter intervals and all in chronological order. Statistically, the, the probability of that being an accident is less than one in 70 million. Astonishing. Properties in the text. Pull one out, pull a letter out from there and it falls apart. It's the integrity of the text that, as, as just a student of uh, the text, staggers me. There's a thing called the appointed time. See, the Jews' catechism is their calendar, according to Rabbi Hirsch. And they have a heptatic calendar. There's a week of days, that's Shabbat, we all know about that. There's also a week of weeks, that's uh, Shavuot. They have the week of months, that's the religious year, if you will. They have the week of years, that's the sabbatical year. And uh, they have seven weeks plus one, the Jubilee year, and uh, where all the land reverts to its owners, slaves go free, and debts are forgiven. That's a a prophecy of the millennium, of course. And the time of the restitution of all things, Peter calls that in Acts chapter 3 in a second sermon. In Genesis chapter 14, uh, chapter 1, verse 14, God says, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven that divide the day and the night, and let there be signs in, for seasons and for days and for years. Now, for the word seasons there is hamoedim, the appointed times. Now, if you search that with a computer throughout the Torah, you discover it should occur quite a few times. It does, only occurs once, strangely. And there are 70 appointed times if you add the Shabbats and the, Sabbaths and the various holidays. Every Jew knows there's 70 appointed times. Not just 52 Sabbaths, but some other Sabbaths on top of that. And so, if equidistant letter sequence it appears only once in Genesis, it's the statistical expectation would be five times in the 78,000 letters of Genesis, but it only appears once at an interval of 70 centered on that very verse. And so, uh, the odds against this being unaided by this unaided chance would have been estimated greater than one, 70 million to one. But the Feast of Israel... The spring feasts in the first month, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits. And then you have the fall feasts, another group. You have the uh, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Each one of the feasts is not only com- historically commemorative, they're also prophetic. And the first three feasts, the first three spring feasts speak of the first coming of Jesus Christ, and they're fulfilled on the very day that they're celebrated. And the last three are also prophetic of his second coming, and we expect them to be fulfilled. But there's this one weird one in between the two, the Feast of Weeks, which most scholars recognize is that the occasion, it's the only occasion in the entire Old Testament where you use leavened bread, so it has a Gentile flavor to it, and it is, of course, the birth of the church, which occurred in Acts chapter 2, occurring on the day that it's celebrated. But it may not be fully celebrated yet, because they also have a tradition in Judaism that Enoch was translated on his birthday, which was the day they celebrate Feast of Weeks. So is there more here to be found? Study it yourself and come to your own conclusions. But uh, if you start studying these ELSs, you'll discover in Isaiah 63, the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament, you find a lot of fascinating things of the people there at the foot of the cross. Caiaphas, Annas, and a number of others. 
But you also find the names of the disciples. You find Peter, Matthew, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, James, and two Jameses, incidentally, Simon, Thaddeus, and Matthias, and three Marys, interestingly enough, Salome and Joseph. How fascinating it is, even one of the Marys is interwoven with the encryptions of John. There's something that's even more bizarre than these names showing up statistically in those 12 verses. There is a word, a name, that's made up of high frequency letters, which means it has a high probability of being there by accident that is astonishing that it's not among them. That's the name of Judas. He's not there. That's, he's missing, strange enough. But Matthias, by the way, from Acts 1, is there, interestingly enough. And you can go through the frequency tables and study that if you like. But again, my summary emphasis here is the Old Testament is in the Old, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. The principal discovery of our ministry, just to remind you, 66 books penned by over 40 guys over almost 2,000 years, and it's integrated. Every detail, every number, every place name is there deliberately, and you need to discover that for yourself to have the impact you need. In 1980, there was a young man from Rwanda that was forced by his tribe to either renounce Christ or face certain death. And uh, he refused to renounce Christ, and he was killed on the spot. When they went to his room, they found this nailed to his wall. The night before, he'd written this and posted it in his room. <clears throat> I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I love that. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. He obviously went to seminary with the alliteration there, I assume. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on His presence, walk by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, or preached up for the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus, and I must go till He comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till He stops me. And when He comes for His own, He will have no problems recognizing me. My banner will be clear. So, okay, let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank You for the privilege of gathering together, and we do indeed claim the name of Christ among us. We thank You for the fellowship that uh, pervades this group here. And we thank You for the opportunities You provided all of us to influence young people, on the reality of your word and the extremes that you've gone to that we might live. We do pray, Father, that you would, through your spirit as well as your word, empower each of us to be more effective stewards of the opportunities before us as we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord Jesus Christ indeed. Amen. And God bless you. Koinonia House is a nonprofit Christian ministry that is supported by the purchasing of materials and donations. To learn more about Koinonia House and the materials that we have available, visit khouse.org. And please be responsible in the sharing and dissemination of this information and respect the copyrights therein. Thank you.